In the previous lecture, we talked about different types of questions you can ask. In this lecture, I want to focus on one specific question people very often ask in the form of a hypothesis test. And I want to ask you whether you really want to test a hypothesis. A hypothesis test is a very specific answer to a very specific question. Throughout this lecture, I'll use a dart game as a sort of metaphor for a hypothesis test, in the sense that both are basically a methodological procedure to decide who is better than the rest. In a dart game, we very often compare two players. In a hypothesis test, we very often compare two hypotheses. Dart games are specifically designed to decide who of two players is better than the other. And a lot of the criteria and the rules around the dart game are implemented in such a way that they give you the best possibility to distinguish which of the two players is better. If you throw a dart a fraction to the left or the right of the divisor between 1 and 20, this can in principle mean that one player might win or lose. This is the nature of a game. In essence, a single dart could determine who wins. This is quite unlikely because most often there are so many different games that the better player wins out more often than the other player. But in essence, this tiny difference could make the difference between who wins and loses. Sometimes a criticism on hypothesis testing is phrased in the sense of surely God loves a p-value of 0.051 just as much as a p-value of 0.049. And that might be true. But in a game, there's still one winner and one loser. The whole point of a hypothesis test is to choose between two possible hypotheses, which of the two is the better. And this might be done on rather trivial differences in extreme and rare cases. When we design a hypothesis test, we divide all possible states of the world into what we predict and what we don't predict. Now, sometimes this is very easy to do in the case of predictions about concrete objects. The best known case here is the prediction that all swans are white. You only need to observe one black swan to falsify this prediction. So the state of the world that is predicted is white swans. The state of the world that is not predicted is a black swan. And if we observe one of these black swans, we know that the situation in the real world represents something that we did not predict. Now, these kinds of tests are more difficult if we have a probabilistic environment. Many situations where we rely on statistical inferences are situations where we can't divide the world into concrete different states. The world is probabilistic. Things are more or less likely to happen. So, sort of more like the grayscale that you can see on the right of this slide. In these situations, we can still divide the world into an area that we predicted and that we didn't predict. We can make our predictions falsifiable by specifying certain rejection rules, which may render statistically interpreted evidence inconsistent with probabilistic theory. So this is a statement by Lakatos, philosopher on science, who says this is one way in which we can actually make theoretical predictions falsifiable even when these are statements about probabilistic events. Lakatos also writes that the name and Pearson approach to hypothesis testing rests completely on methodological falsificationism. It's good to remember that there's a difference between a Fisherian significance test and a Neyman Pearson hypothesis test. The goal of the latter is to prevent incorrect decisions or type 1 and type 2 errors. As Neyman and Pearson themselves write, the goal of their approach is to not be too often wrong. It's interesting to think back about how these people wrote about statistics. And if you never read their original work, I can highly recommend it. Some of the statements that they write about are basically poetry. Let's take a look at one specific page from the book by Fisher on how to design experiments. Here he writes, it is usual and convenient for experimenters to take 5% as a standard level of significance in the sense that they are prepared to ignore all results which fail to reach this standard. 
and by this means to eliminate from further discussion the greater part of the fluctuations which chance causes have introduced into their experimental results. No such selection can eliminate the whole of the possible effects of chance coincidence, and if we accept this convenient convention, with which he means the convenient convention to set the alpha level at 5%, something we'll return to in later modules. So he writes, and if we accept this convenient convention and agree that an event which would occur by chance only once in 70 trials is decidedly significant in the statistical sense, we thereby admit that no isolated experiment, however significant in itself, can suffice for the experimental demonstration of any natural phenomenon. For the one chance in a million will undoubtedly occur with no less and no more than its appropriate frequency, however surprised we may be that it should occur to us. So he's basically saying that we'll always observe flukes in single studies. This possibility always exists and this is why we need to make repeated observations and do experiments multiple times. He writes, in order to assert that a natural phenomenon is experimentally demonstrable, we need not an isolated record, but a reliable method of procedure. In relation to the test of significance, we may say that a phenomenon is experimentally demonstrable when we know how to conduct an experiment which will rarely fail to give us a statistically significant result. So it's important to note that Fisher is talking here about a reliable method of procedure. Neyman and Pearson themselves say such a rule or such a methodological procedure tells us nothing as to whether in a particular case the hypothesis is true when we observe data that is smaller than some threshold or false when we observe data that is larger than some threshold. So we don't make statements about any particular case, but we have a method of procedure that allows us to, with some controlled error rate, distinguish between two players and regularly determine the correct winner. Now you want to reflect on why you would want to test a hypothesis with such a methodological rule. When would you want to do something like this? First, it makes sense that you need to make a decision how to act. In a dart game, we declare one person the world champion, the other person the second best in the world. So this is a decision on how to act. In a hypothesis test, this act can be to either accept or reject the no hypothesis, which means act as if the no hypothesis is true or act as if the no hypothesis is false. You can also, if you want to, remain in doubt. Very often people criticize hypothesis testing as a methodological procedure because it's dichotomous. But this never was the intention. Neyman already wrote that a region of doubt may be obtained by further subdivision of the region of acceptance. You can divide the probabilistic space up in any way that you want. A rejection region, an acceptance region and a region in which you would remain in doubt and would need to collect more data. So reflect on whether you actually need to make a decision. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. In a cumulative science, I would say that very often it is unavoidable to make some sorts of decisions based on a pilot study or an experiment that somebody else did or the validation of some measure that you want to use. The second thing to consider is whether your hypotheses are good players. Is it actually sensible to pit these two against each other or do you know which of these is gonna win to begin with? There is, for example, no need to let me play the world champion in darts. We already know who's gonna win, the world champion, because I don't know how to play darts. In the case of a no hypothesis significance test, randomization is a crucial factor that contributes to the plausibility of the no hypothesis. Because we randomly assign, for example, people to an experimental condition and to a control condition, it's actually somewhat likely that the null hypothesis is true. Remember the statement by Cohen earlier that a null hypothesis significance test might be an interesting question to ask in a carefully controlled experiment. The reason for this is that randomization makes the null a plausible value 
and thus a good player in a hypothesis test. It actually makes sense to test against it. This is not automatically true in correlational research. Sometimes people make the statement that everything is correlated with everything else. There is all sorts of systematic variation among measurements that can lead answers to be slightly higher or slightly lower between different groups of people just because there is systematic variation in the world. In these cases, it's not so exciting to actually test against the value of exactly zero. This systematic noise is sometimes referred to as CRUD. And CRUD is actually a strong argument against testing, against the null hypothesis, in non-experimental research, where there was no randomization to conditions. Luckily, the null hypothesis doesn't need to be a nil hypothesis. You don't need to test against a value of exactly zero. You can divide the world into a range where you accept certain values and reject certain values in any way that you like. So it's perfectly acceptable to have a null hypothesis that's not a point, but a small range around zero where you say, well, there will be some systematic variation, but any value within this small range around zero, those are values that I don't predict. And anything that's large enough outside of this range, that's the stuff that I'm predicting in my hypothesis test. Finally, the last thing to take into account is whether you can actually control the error rate in the study that you are designing. We have carefully constructed a game of darts so that the error rates are actually nicely balanced. We don't throw darts from maybe 100 feet away from the board, because in those cases even the best players would very likely miss the board altogether. We also don't throw a dart from one foot away from the dartboard because then we could just stick it in and we would never make any errors. We can't make decisions when error rates are huge, when our error rates are so high that we're looking at a chaotic pattern. So you want to be able to control the error rate in some sensible way so that you're not wrong too often. The goal of making a successful prediction in this game or in a hypothesis test is to show the predictive validity of a theory. This theory has something going for it. In more fancy terms, and for a word you might want to remember next time that you're playing Scrabble, we're talking in terms of verisimilitude or truth likeness. If your theory can make good predictions, I should be impressed by the verisimilitude of the theory that you came up with. So this is the goal of a hypothesis test. When a dart player wants to demonstrate that they know what they're doing, they might make a prediction, such as saying that the dart will go into the bullseye. If they then throw a dart and it actually ends up in the bullseye, we as an audience are impressed. We think that this dart player knows what they're doing. A hypothesis test should work in a similar manner. We make a prediction, then we collect some data, and if the data support our prediction, we should be impressed by the quality of our hypothesis. Now, of course, there's something slightly peculiar about how we test hypotheses in science. Very often, we don't state in advance what we want to do. It's more like we are dart players who say, sure, I'm predicting that my next dart is going to be in the bullseye. Would you now please leave the room, come back in a minute? And then when we come back in a minute, we see the end result. We see that the dart is sticking in the bullseye, but we don't really know what happened. If we would pre-register our predictions, we see that actually confirming them is much more impressive than if the whole approach to the scientific process is much less transparent. Now, if we think about the cases where you collect data and you do research, there should be situations where maybe you don't need to make a decision you don't have very good hypotheses to begin with. Maybe you didn't do the exploratory research to create good hypotheses. You don't have two good players. Or you can't really set the error rates because you can't control the number of observations, for example. So in these cases, it should make sense that you might not want to test a hypothesis. A hypothesis test in these situations might not be the very specific answer to the question that you're asking. So, I think that in general we should really think whether what we want to do is actually test a hypothesis and stop overusing hypothesis tests. Hypothesis tests are a very specific tool 
that answer a very specific question under very specific conditions.